Okay, let's get started. All right, I assume you guys can all see this here. It's shared correctly. Cool. All right, so last time we talked about the way that we calculate how much medication that we draw up, especially from a liquid, right? We talked about the want over have times volume and how to deal with concentration, how to deal with units and how to get to the medications that we draw up. But all of that is useless unless we know exactly what it is we're going to draw up. And here in New Mexico, you have a really expanded scope of practice when it comes to medications, especially compared to a lot of other places around the country. We talked specifically in that last time about Tylenol and Narcan. Of course, you guys probably all remember that we have uh, epinephrine as well that we can give. But there's actually a few more medications that's in your scope of practice here in New Mexico, and we're going to talk about them. So we are going to cover how they're named, various types of medications, interactions, and effects, of course, the formulary, and we're going to talk about specific medications to New Mexico basics. The formulary is published at the uh, state level. They all have, um, all of them that are in the state formulary up here have different levels assigned to them, and of course they overlap, and they build, right? So medications that a first responder can give, a basic can give, and an intermediate and a paramedic. Medications that a basic can give, everybody above him can give, but not anything below. So a first responder can't give all the medications that a basic can, and as it goes up the list. So when it comes to understanding medications and base, the very, very basics of what they do in the body, we need to study a few things. First of all, pharmacokinetics is basically the study of how drugs move around the body and how they're absorbed. The thing, this idea of biotranslocation, moving things from place to place, moving biological substances. And also understanding how the body metabolizes and processes them and changes their chemical structure. It's called biotransformation. And then, of course, how these drugs are stored in the body and how they're eliminated. Medications can have many, many different names. Um, the first one that you may have encountered was Narcan versus Naloxone, but it's got even more medication names out there. The very, very first name given to any drug is its chemical description. Um, and you see some examples up here. These are given to them and these define through a very set series of rules, the chemical structure. So like this glycerol trinitrate, okay, and this 3-dihydro, 1-methyl, 5-phenyl, 2-H1. Okay. That, that gives a specific structure in mind uh, when, when a scientist is building this chemical and once, once they figure out the structure and name it. Of course, there's the official name, right? That is the name under which the drug is listed in the USP in whatever official uh, publication it's going to be in. And then the two that we are probably the most familiar with are the trade names and the generic names. The trade names are names like Narcan, Tylenol, okay? Um, then you've got generic names, okay? Generic names are usually specific to the type of chemical, but are independent from manufacturer. So there are different types of this. There's... Um, Nitroglycerin, diazepam, those are generic names that don't tie directly back to a manufacturer. Whereas like Bayer aspirin specifically refers to Bayer. A trade name is actually a registered patent. Okay. And they have 17 years of exclusive rights to produce the drug. Now, the reason for this is to allow the drug company that, that spent sometimes billions of dollars researching a drug uh, to recoup some of the money that they put into it. So they get exclusive rights for 17 years to produce that drug, after which um, it goes in, it's allowed to be a generic. 
Medications can interact with one another. Sometimes they're harmful, sometimes they're desirable, sometimes we don't even notice them, but chemicals interact together. Um, and the three main ways that they work in, in real interactions is they increase, decrease, or cancel the effects of the others. So some words that you need to know, synergism. Synergism is when two drugs work together um, to produce effects that neither one produces alone. An example of this would be epinephrine and albuterol that are given together. Okay? In the case of an asthma attack or other severe respiratory issues, they synergize together to produce uh, effects on the breathing system, on our respiratory system, to help in ways that neither one of them alone can. There's also potentiation. Potentiation is when one drug basically amplifies the effects of another or prolongs it. So um, there's a, the one they give here, uh, Benamide, it's an anti-gout medication, actually can be given with penicillin to delay the excretion of it, to allow it to last longer. Okay? Then there's antagonism. It's where a, one drug prevents the absorption or receptor stimulation of another. And we're really familiar with Narcan, right? Narcan um, is a opiate antagonist, okay? It actually knocks off the, uh, the narcotic from the opiate from the opiate receptors in the brain. And that's how it antagonizes the uh, opiate class of medications. There's, of course, a therapeutic effects, right? The things that we want and expect from the drug. We know that nitro is going to cause vasodilation, which is going to cause reduced workload on the heart, which will cause pain relief. Um, we know that albuterol is a bronchodilator and causes reduction in respiratory resistance, which causes easier breathing. Okay. Yes, I will go back. Let me finish this one. There's, of course, side effects, right? Side effects that are not desirable or therapeutic. Um, basically, anything other than those intended by the medication can be considered uh, side effects. So with those last two examples again, right? Vasodilation from nitro can cause headache and hypotension. Same thing, albuterol can cause tremors and tachycardia because of the way that it uh, works in the body. It kind of ramps you up. Let me know when you guys are good with this slide and then I'll go back. I had a request to go back for a couple things on that one. Aiden, I don't think this PowerPoint is on Moodle, but I'm recording this lecture, so I will post it up for you guys. And there's the previous one. Various types of medication and interactions, the synergism, the potentiation, and antagonism. Guys can probably hear my dogs munching on their breakfast in the background. <laughs> Let me know when you're good and I'll uh, move on. Awesome. Okay. And then there are, of course, toxic effects on the body. These aren't just, well, they are undesirable, of course. They're not just inconveniences, right? These are things which can actually harm a patient, their health or their life. Um, they can be from the drug themselves or from the patient, or they can be something like an allergic reaction. They may also classify into an exaggeration of the therapeutic effect, right? So there are medications that have very narrow, what we call therapeutic windows, very narrow uh, stretches of dosage where we actually get the desired effect that we want. And if we take too much of it, too much of a good thing actually can harm the patient. Okay. One example of a toxic effect would be uh, aspirin, right? And because of its elimination of platelet clumping, it's an antiplatelet drug, 
you actually can, if you have an active GI bleed, that can cause hypovolemia and shock. That would be an example of a toxic effect. There are other medications that can cause toxic effects, things like digoxin, which is a more advanced cardiac medication. If you take too much of it, um, you actually get cardiotoxic effects. So toxic effects are something that we have to be aware of. All medications have them. It just depends at what dose and what concentration in the body that will occur. So when we talk about medications, we've got to get uh, some terminology in place. I think dose is something that we're all familiar with. It's the amount of medication that we are going to give a patient to obtain a certain therapeutic effect. Okay? And an indication is under what circumstances do we give this drug? Okay, So an indication for Narcan would be an acute opiate overdose. An indication for epinephrine, one of them, would be a you know, anaphylactic reaction. Then there are contraindications. We have two subcategories of a contraindication. There's a relative and absolute contraindications. So relative contraindications are things that increase risk involved with a particular medication. Okay? Um, there's a medication out there that we use in EMS called ketamine, right? And it has a relative contraindication of somebody that has schizophrenia because there is some evidence to show that uh, the ketamine can actually interact with someone's brain that has schizophrenia and make things worse. But that doesn't mean you're not going to give it. A relative contraindication is more of a caution. Be like, hey, you know, think twice before giving this in these situations. Okay. And you have to weigh whether or not the, the good outweighs the bad. Does the potential for benefit from this medication outweigh these relative contraindications? Okay. And then there are absolute contraindications. These are conditions that completely stop you from giving a drug. They, they prohibit the use of this treatment completely. Uh, some of the most common ones are allergies, right? So if somebody has a, an allergy to a medication, we're not going to give it to them. The one that's listed here, aspirin to an allergic asthmatic, right? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be doing that. Then there's the mechanism of action. Okay, the mechanism of action refers to how a medication actually works in the body and the method that it uses, the mechanism that it uses to accomplish its goal. Okay, well, so we'll see some examples of those coming up. All right. Of course, we have to be aware, and we probably all know that that some people are allergic to specific drugs. Like uh, some of the most common are antibiotics, which you know I can even fall into that category. I am allergic to amoxicillin. Um, people can be allergic to almost any medication out there. Um, antibiotics, narcotic medications, aspirin, and sulfa drugs are the most common ones. You should be familiar with these allergens okay, and be able to give some examples of them, especially when I give you a scenario in lab about, you know, here is a medication that this person is allergic to and be able to tie that back to any medications that you might try to give that fall into that. Okay. You don't need to write down, by the way, you don't need to jot down these sulfa based drugs. I'm not asking you to be familiar with, with all these examples, but you need to be aware of basic classes, right? You, you need to know that morphine, codeine are both narcotics. You need to know that like penicillin, ampicillin, you know, things that end in cillins and mycins, gentamicin are, are antibiotics. You don't need to have all of these specific things down here, especially sulfa-based drugs. So here is the formulary that we use. Here is the medications that we are going to go over today. And I don't need to read this slide to you because we're going to go over each one. This is the one that we worked with um, most of our time during our MedMath lecture, right? This is Tylenol, AKA acetaminophen, also abbreviated as APAP, okay? So you need to know all those different names, Tylenol, acetaminophen, APAP. There are many different formulations of acetaminophen. Um, the one that you see up here is children's Tylenol because here in New Mexico for the EMT basic, this is primarily given for the prevention of pediatric febrile seizure, especially in the context of an extended transport time. Okay. This can be given at higher levels uh, for pain relief and adult fever. 
but it is not necessarily something that you're going to be doing as the EMT basic. But let's go through it. Uh, we're familiar most with this trade name, right? The Tylenol trade name. The type, okay, the class of medication is twofold. It is an analgesic. An analgesic is a medication that reduces pain. It is also an antipyretic, which is why it's given uh, in children and even adults. An antipyretic is a medication that reduces fever. Okay, so it brings a fever down. The indications here that we have in New Mexico for, for the MT basic are uh, febrile kids with extended transport time. This is to prevent a febrile seizure. The route, which is how we give it in the body, right? That is orally. It's done as a liquid suspension and the child will basically uh, take it in through mouth and swallow it. You need to know the dosages for this. Okay, you need to know the indications, uh, the routes, the dosages, and basically everything after that. So 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram for acetaminophen. It is a weight-based dose, which means you're going to have to convert your patient's uh, weight in pounds to kilograms, multiply it by the dose, and that will give you what, your, uh, what the dose is that you're wanting to give that patient. Of course, if somebody has an allergy to it, we don't want to get it, but also somebody that has liver disease because Tylenol is metabolized and, and can actually cause continued damage to the liver. And in fact, a Tylenol overdose will take out someone's liver and that is a terrible way to die. So we don't give this to patients that have liver problems. Some Common side effects are also listed in here. The only one really that we have to be aware of for Tylenol is a rash. That's pretty rare in my experience, though it, it has happened. Okay. Toxic effects, like I mentioned, um, really in overdoses and with existing liver disease, you will see some, some uh, hepatotoxic effects. Any questions on Tylenol? All right. Activated charcoal, we talked about this in the toxicology chapter. This is not a weight-based dose, but it is still a range dose. The overall dose that I want you to remember for this is one gram per kilogram. Here in New Mexico, that's up to a maximum of 100 grams for an adult. But activated charcoal, again, under many different trade names, there's you know, charcoal and Instachar, which are listed up here, but if you actually look at this uh, picture, you see um, Actidose, which is another trade name of this drug. Hopefully you remember that it is an absorbent. It absorbs other medications and uh, chemicals that are in the GI tract that have yet to be digested and absorbed. Okay. Uh, indications are poisoning by an absorbable agent. Refer back to our toxicology chapter and lecture there, which I do have recorded if you need it. Uh, for what classes of medications you can give this to, what types of drugs can be uh, absorbed by this. It's also listed in your book. It is an oral medication with an adult dosage of 60 to 100 grams, okay, or 30 to 60 in a pediatric patient. Contraindications, there are certain medications which are contraindicated for activated charcoal. Those are also found in your book. It has some side effects of nausea and constipation, which we need to know about and tell our patients out ahead of time. Also, it will discolor their stool. Okay, It'll turn it very black, and if they don't know that that's going to happen, that can cause a problem. In severe cases, it can actually cause a toxic effect of a bowel obstruction. Okay. And if somebody is you know, losing consciousness, they can aspirate this, they can breathe it into their lungs, which would also be considered a toxic effect. All right, one that we really haven't touched on very much because we haven't done our inhaled medications lab is albuterol. Okay. Albuterol is a great medication. You probably remember reading about it in the chapter on respiratory emergencies. Albuterol is a fantastic medication that we use quite a lot in EMS. You'll see it under the names of Ventolin, Proventil, and many, many others. There are lots of uh, different companies that manufacture some type of albuterol sulfate solution. 
Okay, its mechanism of action and drug type is a beta-2 agonist. It works on the beta-2 receptors, which work in the lungs. It does this to open up our uh, bronchioles to reduce wheezing, to reduce that constriction. And as indicated in pretty much anything that causes wheezing, right? So general wheezing, asthma, and COPD. Of course, asthma and COPD being the top two that we give it for. Um, it works very, very well, especially when you mix it with another drug, which we'll talk about later, ipotropic bromide. It is given as an inhaled medication, a specifically a nebulized medication generally, though we probably are also familiar with it in a metered dose inhaler, an MDI, that causes someone to inhale a fine powder of it. In EMS, we most commonly give it as a nebulized solution, which is why our dose is two and a half to five milligrams in three milliliters of saline. So the vast majority of the time, you will see albuterol in these bullets. Okay, we call them here in the upper right-hand corner, right? We've got these bullets. And it's gen those are generally 2.5 milligrams each in one and a half milliliters of saline. So that would be the concentration. It would be 2.5 in 1.5. The reason that it's formulated that way is most of the time for an adult, they're gonna get five milligrams. And so when you mix two of these together, you get your three mLs of saline, which fits quite nicely in a nebulizer. I did a video of the inhaled medications lab and that skill that I will be posting for you guys so that you can see how those work before we get back into it um, in our labs when we go back in person. Of course, contraindications for albuterol are present. There's the ever-present allergy contraindication. Just consider that to always be there. Um, and then we have to be careful if they're taking other beta-2 agonists, if they've taken doses of their own albuterol inhaler or other beta-2 agonists. Uh, we, that can build up on it and cause some undesirable effects. Common side effects, okay? Tremor, headache, and then this is supposed to be increasing heart rate. Albuterol amps your heart up. It causes the tremor, the shakes, and causes somebody to kind of feel nervous sometimes. It'll increase their heart rate by several points, uh, which does go away as the albuterol starts to uh, work its way out of their system. In severe cases, it can cause cardiac ischemia. Very, very rare. I personally have never seen that, um, but it does happen. There's also this thing called a paradoxical bronchospasm. A paradoxical bronchospasm is where you have the opposite effect of what you expect. So we normally expect albuterol to open up the lungs. Well, in a paradoxical bronchospasm, it can cause them to shut down again. Fortunately, that's also pretty rare. All right, aspirin. Aspirin is another extremely common medication that we give. Um, it comes under many, many different trade names. It can be just called aspirin. Um, you'll see it sometimes as coated or uncoated aspirin. Um, the other very common one you'll see is Bayer aspirin. They were the original. Okay. And we give low dose, also known as baby or chewable aspirin. Uh, this is important because if we give a coated aspirin, it actually has to get into the intestines in order to be absorbed down. It doesn't absorb as quickly. A non-coated aspirin will break down in the, uh, in the stomach and not be absorbed by the body. It is given for cardiac chest pain. So if you have a patient that has chest pain um, of potentially cardiac origin, they need to give aspirin unless they have a contraindication. I'm not talking about someone that you know like got hit in the chest. If they got hit in the chest with a baseball bat, of course their chest is going to hurt. That would not be an indication for aspirin. But if you have um, chest pain that you can say, eh, I, I suspect this might be cardiac in nature. You don't have to guarantee it, but it might be cardiac in nature. They need to receive aspirin. It's another oral medication and its dose is 81 to 325. The normal adult, adult dose that you will see given is 324, just because we give four baby aspirins and you can't actually get to 325 with an 81 milligram aspirin tablet. Okay, so 324 is our most common adult dose, but anywhere from 81 to 325 is your dose range here in New Mexico. Other than allergy, <clears throat> any patient that's got a bleeding disorder or an active GI bleed, 
okay? Especially if they're, if they're vomiting blood or if they're pooping blood, we do not want to give them aspirin. That can make that bleed worse. Side effects include rash from an allergy and potential nausea. Of course, if they have a bleeding, if they have a bleed going on, the antiplatelets effects lead to a toxic effect of a hemorrhage. It also, in overdoses especially or susceptible individuals, can actually lead to tinnitus, okay, which is that ringing in the ears, which is uh, not a good thing. All right, so epinephrine for the EMT basic here in New Mexico. You will see it in, in scope here as one milligram per ml. We've seen those, uh, these vials in lab, okay? These are the ones you have to break open, use the, uh, the filter straw to get them out. You'll see it under a trade name of adrenaline, though the vast majority of the time it's just packaged as epinephrine, okay? We're looking for a one to 1,000 concentration. It is a sympathomimetic drug, which means it works on the sympathetic nervous system and it is indicated for anaphylaxis and extreme asthma, also known as asthma extremis. Those, it's basically uncontrolled asthma that hasn't been able to be fixed through another route. Uh, it presents very similar to the breathing of anaphylaxis. We give it as a subcutaneous injection here in New Mexico, but for the EMT basic, you must attempt online medical control. In an emergency, if you cannot contact medical control, we can go ahead and give it, but we have to at least attempt first. And you either use an auto injector for it, or you have to use a 0.3 ml syringe, like the insulin syringes that we used in lab. Those are 0.3 ml, also known as a dose limiting syringe. Okay? Our dose for this is 0.3 milligrams, okay? 0 0.3 milligrams for an adult. It is contraindication in a patient having a hypertensive crisis. That's what HTN stands for, a hypertensive crisis. And in patients that have pulmonary edema. Known side effects are tachycardia, headache, and hypertension, which is why we don't give it when somebody already has hypertension. Okay? And at higher dosage, it can cause lethal dysrhythmias because it works directly on the heart. And it can cause cardiac ischemia um, by having the heart work harder. Any questions on epinephrine? Okay. Ibuprofen, okay, this is used here in New Mexico in EMT basic scope of practice in pediatrics and adults for fever or pain control only. Okay, uh, the most common trade name for ibuprofen is Advil, though there are others out there. It is an NSAID or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. These are drugs that we take over the counter. We probably have them in our house, We've probably taken them before, but they are in the EMT basic scope of practice for fever and or analgesia. These two are given through an oral route, either as a pill or as a liquid children's um, suspension. The dosage for an adult is two to 400 milligrams. So generally, and these, these, um, reddish ones that are up here are probably what you're familiar with the most. These are what's sold in bulk. And these are 200 milligram tablets. So one to two of those tablets. In peds, it's another uh, weight-based dose. It is 10 milligrams per kilogram. So once again, you have to convert their weight to kilos and then multiply by this dosage. The contraindications for this, an active AMI, so if you suspect that someone um, is having a heart attack, we don't want to give them ibuprofen. And then this is for uh, all insects as well, any active GI bleed, ulcers, or of course, allergic reactions. Side effects you see listed, headache, hypertension. It can increase, as a toxic effect, it can increase the risk of thrombosis, okay? can cause a clot to form, and it can cause congestive heart failure in certain patients. Though once again, this is a pretty rare effect. All right, I promised it, ipotropium bromide. Ipotropium bromide is sold under the trade name of Atrovent. Okay. It is an anticholinergic medication, and it is actually used mostly in conjunction with albuterol uh, during a respiratory issue, specifically asthma a lot of the time. And it causes everything to dry up. It is given in those cases to 
dry up the secretions and the gunk and the mucus that forms in our bronchial passages. So it works together with albuterol. Albuterol causes the bronchial passages to open up and relax, and the ipotropium bromide or atrovent causes the bronchioles to dry out and get rid of the uh, mucus that can form during these attacks, which will cause even easier breathing. It too is usually in a uh, bullet form, okay? And generally we give it in 500 microgram, or as you'll see it more commonly referred to 0.5 milligrams, okay? So 0.5 milligrams for an adult and 0.25 milligrams for pediatrics. So you can remember it however you want. Just know, just be able to remember that 500 micrograms is half of a milligram. And 250 micrograms is a quarter or 0.25 of a milligram. If a person is allergic to it or atropine, okay, we don't want to give it because of um, atropine and this being the same class of medication. So someone that is allergic to that will probably also be allergic to ipotropium bromide. Of course, it's side effects. Um, basically anything that anticholinergic medication, they can cause dry mouth, headache, throat irritation because they just dry everything, and that's what we would expect to see. It has no known toxic effects. Here in New Mexico, you have to give it either with or immediately after albuterol. We don't give it uh, by itself for the MT Basic. Okay, the Mark I kit. This is a auto-injector tusum that contains praldoxamine, that 2-PAM, and generally contains atropine. Okay, to work as an anti, what's called an anticholinesterase inhibitor. Okay, um, you'll see these under Mark One. They could be called duo dotes. Um, those are just names that you'll see them under. Okay, and you'll see up here. Sometimes it's just extremely generic. This has atropin auto injector. All right, um, its indications are nerve agent exposure. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about those towards the end of the course when we're talking about terrorism and, and other things. But you remember from our talks lecture, we talked about nerve agents and either dumbbells or what I prefer, the sludgem acronym, which just means that everything is going to be wet. Okay, go back to that lecture or your book if you need to refresh on what sludgem is. The route that we give it is uh, through an auto injector. Okay, here in New Mexico, generally for an adult only, it's going to contain two milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of Tupam. Any contraindications, we don't give this to children, small children, and any contraindications given to you by an emergency physician, that your MSEP. Okay? It has no toxic effects when used as indicated, which is good for us. Okay, naloxone or Narcan, another medication you need to know backwards and forwards because it's going to wind up being in a lot of your scenarios. Goes under the trade name of Narcan generally. You may use either one interchangeably. Most people know uh, Narcan. A lot of people know naloxone as well. It is a narcotic antagonist, which means it's going to have a higher affinity for those narcotic receptors in the brain and actually be able to knock them off, which is how it works. Its indication is for opiate-induced respiratory depression. So anytime that we suspect someone has taken an opiate and they have uh, depressed respirations, we want to try to give them Narcan. Refer back to your text if you need to know other indications for a narcotic overdose. But of course, the most common is respiratory depression and pinpoint pupils. We can give it through all our major routes, subcutaneous, intramuscular, and intranasal. Okay. You give it in a, through an intramuscular route and in a sub-Q route, 0 0.4 milligrams. Okay, you can give that up to five times to a maximum of two milligrams. You will also give um, two milligrams all at once if you're going to give it through the nasal route. The only known contraindication is an allergy to it. And of course, it can cause nausea and agitation as it takes away their high, uh, but you also will increase their breathing and they live so kind of a fair trade-off. In extreme circumstances, it can cause cardiac dysrhythmias and can cause hypertension, though once again, as most of these are, it's pretty rare. Nitroglycerin, another really important drug for you to know. Okay? This is something that's given to patients that are uh, suspected of having 
some type of uh, ischemic chest pain or angina, you'll see this come not only as a generic, just nitroglycerin, but also as something called nitrobid, nitrostat. Anything that has the word nitro in it, you should be uh, suspicious of having nitroglycerin. Okay. It is considered an anti-anginal or anginal, depending on which way you're going to pronounce that. What it does is it causes the uh, blood vessels in the heart to actually dilate, okay? and it can cause an increase in blood flow past something, a, a full blockage or a partial blockage to allow blood flow to be restored to the muscle in the heart, because that's what's causing chest pain. Cardiac chest pain is caused by uh, not enough blood getting to the heart muscle. Generally, its route is sublingual, which means it's going to be a pill, uh, tablet, or other type of spray sometimes that will go underneath the tongue and is directly absorbed through the mouth. These are given in 0 0.4 milligram dosages and can be given up to three times. Uh, we have to have online MSEP before you give it as an EMT basic, and we have to be assisting a patient with their own medication. Okay. Contraindications for nitroglycerin include intracranial pressure, which that's what ICP is, hypotension, that's low blood pressure, and of course, an allergy. We expect it to cause nausea and a headache. Okay? It can also cause syncope or passing out because it does work systemically to cause vasodilation, which can lower systemic blood pressure, and that can cause someone to get, uh, get pretty woozy and sometimes even pass out. Of course, in higher dosages and higher amounts, it can actually cause a heart block, which is a, uh, a blockage of the electrical transmission in the heart. It can cause low blood pressure, very low, so hypovolemia shock even. And of course, decreased heart rate. That's what's supposed to be there. Okay, this is one that you need to know backwards and forwards because it will show up in every cardiac, every chest pain uh, scenario that you give. Oral glucose. We talked about this in the endocrine chapter, used to treat hypoglycemia in a patient that is awake enough to have a protected gag reflex, and they have to be able to protect their own airway. We give 15 milligrams per tube, generally, and we can give that anywhere up to three times for altered mentation. Okay? It, is, it is just glucose. It's what's considered a caloric medication, which means it's, it's, just, it's just food. It's just cellular food. It's given orally, um, and the contraindication is altered mentation. Somebody that is not able to, to mentate properly, can't protect their own airway, that is, is somebody that we wouldn't want to give something to by mouth of uh, fear that they uh, aspirate. It can cause severe hyperglycemia if somebody takes too much, right? You can actually bounce their, uh, their blood glucose level back the other direction, so we have to be careful in the amounts that we give it. All right, so how do we give these medications? Well, all of them we want to use an aseptic technique. Okay, it's not sterile. We're not trying to get rid of everything, but we want everything to be as clean as possible when we give it. That's why we talked about cleaning the sites before injections, cleaning the, uh, the tops of medications, okay, having gloves on and clean hands before we give it. If we're going to give a medication orally to someone, we want to have clean gloves on, okay? Everything that's sharp, everything that's a needle, needs to be disposed of immediately after its use. We don't want to leave them sitting around. We don't want to drop them on the floor. We don't want to stick them in the bench seat. We need to get rid of them right away to prevent a, uh, a dirty needle from sticking you. Okay? Know all the routes of administrations for all of these drugs that we talked about in our scope. Most importantly, own mistakes that you make. Okay, I've told most of you about, um, you know, a med error that I had as a young paramedic. It's, it's something that happens. When that happens, you need to take responsibility and you need to call MSEP um, you know, to find out if there's additional things that you need to do or precautions that you need to take if you accidentally made a med error. Okay, and Document it very thoroughly. So, Know your drug dosages. I expect you guys to know the dosages of all these medications that we talked about. Okay. As a brief review, remember that we, um, we talked about how to convert pounds to kilos, but what we did not talk about that's really useful in here is the standard method of calculating a child's weight 
when nobody knows exactly what it is. So in general, age times two plus eight. Okay, so a four-year-old would weigh how much approximately in kilograms if he's four years old? Somebody type it in for me. Almost, so it's age times two plus eight. So our order of operations says we do the multiplication first. So if he's four years old, okay, four times two is eight. And then eight plus six, I, mean, I don't know why I thought 12. That's my bad, you guys are absolutely right. It's 16, I'm an idiot, never mind. You guys, yeah, never mind, we'll move on. Okay, so if they are five years old, it's gonna be the same thing. H times two is 10 plus eight is now 18 kilos. So this is the quick way to convert it. I expect you to know this. If I don't give you a weight for a pediatric patient, I will tell you, um, estimate the child's weight. Okay? And if you see that on a quiz or a test, I expect you to use this formula, H times two plus eight. Gives you that weight in kilos, not pounds. Okay? If you're given it in pounds, of course, you know that 2.2 pounds equals one kilo. We divide, we talked about that, um, and we talked about that mass and volume is not the same thing, that one milligram is not the same thing as a milliliter, but that cubic milliliters and cubic centimeters, so milliliters and cubic centimeters, cc and ml, actually are the same thing. They're both measures of volume. And then if you need a quick review on it, this is drug calculations, right? It's your want over have times volume. Refer back to my other video on that if you need a refresher. All right, and that is what I have right now. Um, I will post this video into Moodle along with this PowerPoint. There are some drug calculation practices in here that you can go through if you desire. I encourage you to do that to get the practice. Any questions?